My main research focus at the moment is quantifying the public health benefits of exposure to the natural environment. Uh, and I'm, given that I'm with the Forest Service, I'm particularly focused on trees, urban trees. Um, now, sort of the idea that exposure to nature is good for us, for our health and well-being, this isn't new. Um, you know, if you asked, for example, Van Gogh here, who was painting this mulberry tree as he's recovering in the asylum in saint Romain after cutting off his own ear, he mentioned this particular mulberry tree several times in letters home to his brother. He said it was very calming to paint that. Certainly if you talk, you know, people like Thoreau or John Muir in the 19th century, and then more recently, E.O. E. Wilson with biophilia talked about uh, the yeah, human affinity for nature. Uh, Richard Louvre wrote a book, you know, the nature deficit, dis coined the term nature deficit disorder with last child out in the woods. So certainly, and indeed that link between nature and, and health is very intuitive to talk about and very appealing to talk about in general. But it turns out it's a real pain to actually do the rigorous empirical work that would demonstrate that link. It's fine to wave your arms about but as a lot of subjects, when you actually want to do the quantitative work, the sort of joy seeps out of the whole procedure a lot, quite quickly. Um, so I'm going to talk about a couple of you know, somewhat unusual approaches I've taken to quantifying this relationship. Hopefully, uh, you might find it illuminating. And the first, I used the spread of an invasive uh, tree pest as a natural experiment to see uh, if the link between trees and health, so if we lose a lot of trees in a short amount of time, do we see an impact on public health. And in the second, um, what I used was actually uh, uh, tree moss from urban trees as a way uh, to try and quantify the relationship between trees and air quality. Now this is an interesting uh, sort of case study in what happens when a study goes off the rails, but in kind of interesting ways. So, uh, but interesting in the sort of Chinese curse sense. And um, well, I'll get to that. But uh, I'll begin with the bugs. So, <coughs> One of the biggest headaches when you're doing uh, this sort of, sort of, I guess, environmental epidemiology is residual confounding. Um, certainly this is the case with other studies in epidemiology or other econometric studies for that matter. But it's a real pain when you're looking at trees and health. Because, you know, if you're looking in urban areas, where are there more or be better maintained trees or the older trees? They're going to be neighborhoods that are whiter, wealthier, and better educated. Uh, and we certainly know that race, education, and income major drivers of public health. So untangling this relationship uh, can be a real pain. And the, another problem is, is that trees, are, they, they grow at a tiresomely slow rate. You know, they're, they're, they're really, I've actually come to sort of personally resent this slow growth. <laughs> um, you know, as this is about me. So they can be quite difficult to experimentally manipulate. Um, not that this can't be done, but it would be it's expensive and time consuming. If you imagine, let's say, doing a randomized controlled trial of the effects of trees on health, you're looking at millions and millions of dollars and, and decades of time. Uh, it would be good to see this done, but uh, in the meantime, uh, you're, you're stuck often with observational studies. Um, so, where am I at? Um, so, about five years ago, I was kind of I was worried about this because you know, I've done some just straight cross-sectional studies and I was kind of getting a stomachache because I wasn't really, I was concerned that I maybe hadn't been able to adequately control these other drivers. And I realized then, this is my grand revelation, that if trees are good for you, that's my general hypothesis, then killing them should be bad for you, right? That one would, it would seem, yes, right? That's, that's what, that's what uh, passes for a grand revelation uh, for me. But that would seem to be the case. Well, why is that important from a methodological point of view? Well, trees die a lot quicker than they grow. So that you, if you're looking at tree loss, you can see uh, you know, a tree loss over a much shorter amount of time than tree growth. Uh, so what this maybe opens up the possibility is doing longitudinal studies of changes in the natural environment, where growth is just really impractical. Maybe loss is a bit more practical, but Still, you're going to need to have a lot of trees die in a relatively short amount of time. What could do that? Well, uh, tree bugs. Invasive pests are doing an admirable job of uh, killing a lot of trees in a short amount of time in various parts of the world. Uh, in the last 15 years in, in the U.S., probably the, the worst has been uh, the emerald ash borer. Um, it's, as you might imagine, it's green and it bores holes in ash trees. Um, it's first confirmed in Detroit in 2002, since spread to 25, 26 states, killing hundreds of millions of trees. Uh, ash is both a, you know, endemic in certain parts of the country, but it's also a very popular urban tree, even out of its range. 
Unfortunately, it was often planted to replace elm after Dutch elm. So in the Midwest, you know, you could be 60 years old and lived on the same street. You might have seen mature elm cut down and now mature ash cut down uh, through different waves of invasive species. Um, and it kills all 22 species of North American ash and it kills all untreated species. So I'll give you a sense of what it does. This is Toledo, Ohio in 2006 and this is the same street in 2009. Yeah, from my point of view, magnificent. Um, you know, certainly fits the bill uh, that you, you can get some pretty drastic changes in the natural environment in a short amount of time. But as you care about things, it's actually a handsome little beast. Um, you're actually very rarely going to see this because it's quite small and it actually exit holes high up on the tree. But that's, that's the problem there. Um, so, oh, just as an aside, you know, invasive tree pests are really becoming a, um, a problem, increasing problem worldwide. This graph comes from a 2013 science article. See the line A there, that's the cumulative number of tree pests in the US. Um, I think, is it C or D? Oh, B. No, B, let's see. Oh, yes, B there is the high impact ones, whatever that means. I can't remember exactly how it's mentioned, and then these other ones are in Europe. So you clearly see the number of tree pests is increasing. Um, so this was from an article they were talking about loss of ecosystem services. They weren't really considering public health. But I think, um, you know, invasive pests, certainly we know that they can be, you know, real ecological and indeed economic problems. But I would argue, and hopefully you're going to demonstrate, there's a real public health problems with invasive pests as well. So um, how could I take advantage of the spread of EAB? Well, this is an you know, economic audience, so I can do a pretty you know, sophisticated uh, demonstration of my hypothesis here. Um, we have uh, you know, people happy, they're happy because they've got trees, so you know, nothing in life can touch them. Along comes some of them, EAB comes along, trees die, and, and down they fall too. So I can take anybody through that again if that's <laughs> tricky, but that's essentially my hypothesis. Um, and that's probably at the level, I think, for the most part. So this isn't a true experiment. You know, clearly we're not randomly assigning which trees die. Uh, the bug is picking. But it does so in a kind of wonderfully random fashion. This little animation shows the spread from 2002 through 2013. And you'll see there's this kind of wave-like spread, clearly, as the little bug you know, just flies from county to county. It'll stop here after the second wave. But you also see these satellite populations popping up, you know, hundreds of miles from the nearest one. Here, the westernmost one is Boulder County in Colorado, clearly hundreds of miles from the nearest uh, case there in, uh, I think that will be uh, Kansas City, Missouri, it looks like. Um, it's because it gets, it gets moved accidentally in firewood, even though when you have Emerald Ashbor in a county, the quarantine firewood, it still gets moved. It can just jump onto cars. Uh, often the first place it appears in the county is roadside rest areas. You just, you know, that's how it gets there. This, uh, using my fine pointer here, this apparently people think that this actually started by people moving uh, firewood to a NASCAR race in Tennessee. Um, so yeah, it, it gets moved around. So you have this uh, wonderfully random component. So rather than the problem when you're looking at a cross-sectional study where you're looking at the pr presence of trees at one point in time, we're now looking at the loss of trees. And it's difficult to imagine another sort of major driver of public health that would change uh, as fast as this and following this sort of pattern. Could we think of, say, race, education, or income changing in this way? It just doesn't follow this sort of pattern. So this, this pattern, this, both the speed and the pattern spread, is a real godsend uh, from a sort of methodological point of view. Um, now, what outcomes... You know, this is still an observational study, so we need a plausible story going in. What health outcomes could plausibly be affected by um, the loss of trees? We think of being probably four main mechanisms that might mediate the relationship between trees and health. We know air quality. Certainly we know from experiments that trees can uh, improve air quality. We also know from randomized controlled trials that trees can reduce short-term markers of stress. You stick people out in the natural environment, the heart rate is going to go down, blood pressure is going to go down, salivary cortisol, the stress hormone is going to go down. Uh, we also uh, know that greener environments tend to encourage people to exercise, and we certainly know that. 
as a driver of health. And then one of the interesting ones as well, uh, I didn't really aware of this, is that greater neighborhoods, you can have higher levels of social connectivity. And loneliness will kill you. You know, that's a very, very strong risk factor for a whole range of diseases. Uh, so social connections are really very protective against a range of health outcomes. So what I decided to do in this case was look at uh, cardiovascular and lower respiratory mortality. Those are two causes of death that certainly could be linked with that. Uh, all those mechanisms, to one degree or another, could link trees and those causes of death. Those are big causes of death. They're the first and third leading causes of death in the U.S., and I decided to look at mortality just pragmatically because the data are better. And getting data on just incidence of disease is always a little trickier. So what I decided to do here was look at county level mortality from 1990. So these, uh, you know, these little squares here are, are counties, U.S. counties, from 1990 through 2007, which was as there's quite a lag in the U.S. getting mortality data. That was as, as late as I could get it at the time. Uh, so you have this long running period, this is a, you know, a panel data set, you have a long running period, then you add the bug and you see what happens. And so I estimated a, just a fixed effects uh, uh, you know, panel model here. And what did I find? Well, I found that uh, certainly you controlled for differences in uh, demography between counties. I found that counties infested with emerald ash borer had higher rates of both cardiovascular and lower respiratory disease. And interestingly, the sort of size and magnitude of this effect got greater the longer an infestation progressed. It takes a while for the trees to die. So you're essentially seeing a dose-response relationship, which is encouraging. I also saw um, higher, uh, bigger impacts in counties uh, with uh, above average median household income. Why would that be? Um, well, you know, as I said, those counties that are wealthy are going to tend to have more trees, better maintained trees. Uh, so you would expect a great health benefit from them, so you would expect a great health impact when you take them away, which is indeed uh, precisely what I did find. And so um, across, this was at 15 states in six years, so an additional 15,000 deaths from cardiovascular disease and 6,000 from low respiratory. So you know, non-trivial numbers, and you start to get eye-popping results like that. Of course, if you, like me, and have a delicate ego, you don't tell anybody, but you, know, you sit in your office and try and break them yourself. Better private disappointment than public humiliation. Having tried both, I can certainly tell you the former is better. And uh, so what I did in this case was I want to look at, you know, accord, certainly the, the cardiovascular and low respiratory mortality. There are plausible mechanisms linking that and loss of trees. But what about a cause of death that could not be plausibly linked with loss of trees? Do you see a relationship there? So I looked at accidental death. You know, beetles are not causing car accidents. And I didn't find a relationship there. Is, is that definitive? Is say like a, no, it is not. But it's encouraging that you find a relationship where there could be one, and you don't find a relationship where there can't be one. Always, you know, if, certainly if I'd found a relationship, then, you know, something else would have been going on. Now... I use county level mortality in this study because it's easy to get hold of. I always, frankly, thought this was a bit of a long shot study. So I was like, you know, I was pretty happy I turned something up. But it's an ecological study. I'm looking at county level mortality. And uh, certainly ecological studies have their problems. Ultimately, we care about individuals. We don't know whether these county level results apply at the individual level. So having found these initial results, I decided to go one step further and look at um, the effect on individual health. And to do this, I used a health data from the Women's Health Initiative, which is a, a large cohort study in the U.S. of postmenopausal women. So women were 50 to 79 at recruitment. It's so 161,000, followed from the mid-90s on. So uh, I looked at them, and I, I estimated a time-to-event model, which is not something that's used in economics quite as much, but it's very common in epidemiology and engineering, where you're looking at you know, how long does it take for a something to happen. And in this case, I defined an event as one of three things happening. Somebody having a stroke or heart attack or dying from cardiovascular disease. So that was my event. Um, and uh, what I found was that a woman's risk of one of these things happening was 25% higher in counties infested with emerald ash borer. And this is after controlling for age, race, education, income, smoking status, BMI, exercise, emotional well-being, diabetes, hypertension. This is a very a detailed, uh, it's a great, you know, very high quality data in this study. 
So that was encouraging that you see this, again, not definitive, but it's encouraging when you have a couple of observational studies, different data sets, you have different scales, and you see consistent results. That is encouraging. Now, since my, this, so the original paper came out in 2013, 2013 the second paper, 2015, uh, a number of other people have tried to look at the impact of um, emerald ash borer on a range of health outcomes, well, health-related outcomes. Uh, so, for example, a 2015 paper, they looked at the relationship between emerald ash borer and the probability of engaging in outdoor recreation. So, um, if you actually concentrate on this panel in the top uh, left there, so you have on the uh, y-axis against the probability of engaging or changes in the probability of engaging in outdoor recreation, and then you have uh, from infestation here along the x-axis. So that would be you know, where the first year after infestation. So you can see there's no impact before it gets there, which is always encouraging. Uh, and then for uh, up to five years, you see uh, that there's a you know, significantly reduced probability of engaging in outdoor recreation fading over time. We suggest that maybe some of the impact of Emerald ash borer and health may be mediated through uh, changes in exercise. Sorry, just ask a question. Yeah. Women's health uh, initiative mm. study. So, what was the exposure? Was it? Is it the, it in the county? Yeah, so it was a, in that sense, it was a semi ecological study. Right. So, the, in, the outcome was individual, but the, the exposure. exposure was county level. Right. Yeah. Just, and uh, we, I did various ones at zero one or just years since, years of uh, infestation. Um, so, is it interesting? So I've been kind of thinking about more possibilities for natural experiments, uh, and clearly there are other um, there are other pests. But I also realise you don't actually necessarily have to have a change uh, in the natural environment. You could also have change in access to the natural environment. Um, I grew up in England uh, at the time. You could, uh, you know. The, I was in quite a dense urban area, and the school grounds where I was was one of the largest green areas available to people. And I don't know whether you could officially go onto those grounds, but everybody did. And then a few years ago, I went back uh, in, in a sort of ill-advised bout of nostalgia. I decided to go see my old school, um, and it was a fence now, and so I climbed over it, and I got, I got caught by the security guys and thrown out, <laughs> and uh, which was a little humiliating, but. Um, so now, you know, so if you're actually doing this now, if, you're, if you have these green spaces and you're now preventing access to them, would we expect to see any public health impact from them? Quite possibly. So that's, that's one possibility. Um, also, some of this work, you know, the Emerald Ashborough work has had a, a lot of uh, media coverage. So I get contacted by reporters a lot. And last week I had a, a bit of a bleak experience. I was contacted by a reporter from a Wired magazine because there's a, a new bug... Uh, in Southern California called the polyphagus shot hole borer. So it's a nasty little creature. I think in a, that Southern California could lose up to 40% of its urban tree canopy cover. So potentially disastrous. So this person was trying to say, can you take my results and apply them? And I was saying, well, you know, you have to be careful here, trying to show nuance. And he seemed to be getting it. And so a few days ago, the, this, the they got the uh, headlines for this study came out, and I was like, oh, this is going to be interesting. You know, it seemed to be a guy who finally got it. And this is um, what the headline was. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, uh, oh, oh, dear. Yeah, so I don't know if the message didn't get through or he got it. I was like, oh, I don't want that message. That sucks. So let's go with something a little more overwrought. Uh, so what are the dangers of talking to uh, reporters? So... Um, <laughs> it's also good to be uh, in a different hemisphere from your uh, risk-averse bosses when this sort of thing comes out. Um, so now I'm going to switch gears uh, completely and talk about something quite different. Moth. Uh, this particular species of moth is called Orthotricum. Uh, this, is, this picture is actually taken uh, about 10, 20 miles outside Portland. You can tell this is a really nice air quality area because the moss is good and shaggy, but you'll see all these nice lichens on here. So uh, this is actually a pretty good uh, air quality area. So why am I showing you a picture of moss? Well, um, as I said, one of the possible mechanisms linking trees and uh, health outcomes is improvements in air quality. So I thought, well, let's see if I, I want to do a study looking at that. 
And in Portland, we have pretty good um, imagery. We have sub one meter resolution imagery of urban trees. So we have pretty good data on where the urban trees are. Indeed, now we have LIDAR, so we can actually look at the heights. So that's great. But we have terrible air quality data. And in fact, that's the most, developed, most countries in the world have shockingly bad air quality data. In Portland, the, uh, the, the city itself is 600,000, the metro area, 2 million. In the city, we have one permanent air quality monitor. What does that tell you? Nothing. nothing. It tells you if you happen to live next to it. But it would be better to have no air quality monitors and be honest about not knowing than giving ourselves the sort of delusion that somehow we are uh, effectively monitoring that. So, you know, I can't look at the effect of trees on air quality when I don't know anything about air quality. Um, but I have a colleague who is a lichenologist uh, and a bryologist, uh, so studies moss and lichens. And she's used them as a bioindicators of air quality They're out in the woods. They're looking at, you know, the, the health of... Uh, often you can both look at the species composition, you know, the species tend to be richer, but you also actually take them and grind them up and, uh, and look at them. Because moss are interesting little beasts. They have no roots. Uh, they all, uh, so they get all their water from the air. So very good bioindicators of air quality. You don't... They're not going to get anything from the ground. They're not even going to get anything from the, the substrate, from the tree itself. They also have no waxy epidermis. So the, the pollutants actually can get into the moss tissue pretty easily. And they're pretty cheap to, to analyze. There was a couple of uh, different uh, classes of pollutants in this study. The one I'm going to talk about is heavy metals. It's about $50 a sample. So it's not, not really all that expensive. When the large air quality monitors can cost hundreds of thousands of years to hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to operate. So, what do we do? Well, from December the 2nd to December the 23rd, 2013, and we did this in winter because we were also looking at a class of pollutants called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which I have a very hard time saying, and they come from burning fossil fuels, and they are, so they have higher levels in the winter. So we had to endure going out and get very cold fingers in the winter. So, this is a very rare December sunshine in Portland. So there's me kind of on the edge of town picking moss samples. Again, this, this is right on the edge of town. So again, pretty shaggy moss. You can see a few lichens on the trees there. But when you would get more into the urban part of town, you see now there's no lichens on that tree. The moss gets kind of stunty and a little blackened. But this particular species, just you couldn't kill it. We'd find it underneath freeways. Didn't seem to matter. But the lichens just roll over and die. They're, they're pitiful. Um, but this particular species of moss is, is indestructible. So we collected 347 samples. And how we did this is we divided this, the city into 1K grids. And then we randomly placed a point where we picked an address in that point, And we'd go to that address, and then we'd find the nearest moss sample. Uh, but we also put 72 uh, samples that were an additional ones that were 0 to 100 meters from one of those base sample points. And the reason we did this is that we anticipated that there would be a lot of spatial autocorrelation uh, in this model between uh, that we've seen this in uh, this, these sort of pollution studies before. And what we were really going to do in this model is we were going to use the model for spatial prediction. That is, we were going to train the model on 347 points, and then we were going to use it to predict uh, in this heavy metal concentrations on a 50-meter grid across the city. Because, as you see, the covariates you can generate any way you want, just using GIS. And so that was 173,000 points. So to, but to do that, for spatial prediction, you want to have a pretty good idea of the, uh, the three spatial parameters. For those of you not familiar with them, uh, this is a, for the semi-variograms. They, they basically demonstrate uh, you compare pairs of residuals across space. And you know, like any residual plot, patterns are dead that you do not want to see patterns. Uh, and so this is, a, this is actually from this particular model. What you can see is that the pairs of residuals are more similar the closer they are together. This is classic. This is, you know, semi-variogram that could come out of a sort of spatial statistics book. And the, the three parameters here, this thing here, it's called a nugget. It's a stupid name because a lot of this stuff originally came out of mining. And then up here, it's called the partial sill. And then how far out? that goes is called the range, so like 15, 1,700 meters. Beyond that, points become spatially independent. So to g they're relatively close in. So to, to really characterize those well, you need some points that are close together. 
So that's why we added in those extra points that were close together. So we did that. Um, and now I can just turn over my little piece of paper here. Uh, so because certainly, in this case, if you were interested purely in uh, statistical inference, you wouldn't need to go to this extra effort because the spatial parameters in that case are, are more nuisances than anything else. So when we, we collect these samples, we would keep them cool, uh, and then we take them to the lab. We would clean them up. You don't wash them because we don't want to wash off stuff, but you just you clip off the dead material. You get rid of the weird bugs and things that end up in there, and then we send them off to the lab to have them tested. Now, the first one of the heavy metals that we looked at was cadmium. The cadmium is, is really noxious stuff. It's uh, carcinogenic. Uh, it's also neurotoxic, and if that doesn't get you, it'll also get your kidneys. So really not very pleasant stuff at all. And it actually comes from a limited number. Well, the biggest source is, uh, is food. Um, it comes a lot from uh, leafy green vegetables in particular. It's this, for that reason, it's also why you get a lot of cadmium from smoking, because the tobacco plant is good at taking up cadmium. So you end up, smokers tend to have about double the urinary cadmium than, than non-smokers. But we also do get it from atmospheric sources. It comes from metal smelting. It's used as a, in plastics manufacturing. And then along with uh, a lot of other heavy metals, it's used as pigments in a variety of industries. So um, the reason we start to look at this is that the, the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality, which is a state-level environmental regulator, there was basically they realized that even in their pitiful amounts of monitoring, they'd realized that there was too much cadmium in Portland. They couldn't really explain why it is. And their response to that was go, oh, well, um, okay, that's, that's, that's unfortunate. So uh, we talked to them, and they're like, well, you know, if you can help us out with that, that would be great. So, okay, uh, let's start with cadmium. Um, so what we did is we look at this map. So th this, this map here, and what we did, uh, because for various reasons we really abused the variables, so I've just standardized them here. So the map is standardized atmospheric cadmium. So you can see it's dominated by these two big hot spots here, one here and one here, right? And uh, so we thought to ourselves, again, remember, still at this point, we were interested in how could the trees possibly reduce the cadmium. So we thought, okay, we need to take into account the known sources. So we, we contacted the DEQ and we said, can we have the permit data? So what I've done here is I've plotted the 10 biggest uh, permitted emitters of cadmium in the city. So all the permitted emitters are these purple circles. And the area of the circle is proportional to the amount of cadmium they were allowed to emit. So we plotted them, and we're expecting you know, some of the big emitters to be right in the middle of those bullseyes. And they weren't. They're not even close. You can see there's not there's the red crosses I'm getting to. But you see, the, the purple circles, and they're not in the middle of those at all. So that was a bit concerning. So you know, what, what's that about? So we went back to DEQ and said, well, you know, you seem to have these two hotspots that don't, are not explained uh, by known sources. And they said, oh, that's unfortunate. Look at um, electroplating and uh, glass manufacturing. They suspected that. So we contacted all the electroplating businesses in Portland. Now, cadmium electroplating is a very specialized thing. It's really used in the aerospace industry in particular. And there's only one business, and that's this one in Portland, that does that. So it's clearly not that. We're not, electroplating isn't the problem. We then contacted glass manufacturers, and we only colored ones because it's, I mean, cadmium's a pigment used in reds, yellows, oranges. And what we found is that these are stained glass manufacturers right in the middle of those two bullseyes. They particularly make art glass. Uh, this one, ironically, is called bullseye glass, uh, and this one's called Ouroboros glass. And neither had a permit to emit cadmium. Uh, and in fact, this one didn't have any air quality permits at all. And Bullseye had been there for 42 years in the same location. And um, so we were a bit concerned about this, uh, obviously. So we thought, well, you know, before we start pointing fingers, let's kind of dot our I's and cross our T's here. So the thing is, we also looked at um, other heavy metals that were used in glass manufacturing. And so in this next slide, these are just, uh, we didn't use a fancy spatial model here. These are just plain Krieg values. So on the top here, we have arsenic. And arsenic is used uh, in that, it's using greens as well. It also does some things to surface, and they use it a lot. 
So here we find the biggest hotspot is uh, uh, directly over bullseye glass. You see there's some other ones. This one turned into a political disaster area. It's a big aerospace manufacturer. One of the top, it's like the 300th biggest company in the country. So we so had... That looks, like, that looks like where the electroplating was being done. No, electroplating is kind of over here. Okay. Yeah, let's see if I can get, see if we can get it back. It's kind of over, like straight uh, down, yeah. So that's, that yeah, that was further to the east. Um, yeah, this is a precision, it's actually called precision cast parts. They also have a huge nickel hotspot. They actually turned out, we, I ended up having to have my own lawyer from the Justice Department of the, the, their particular response to this one. It turned to be a nightmare. Now, Ouroboros, interestingly, had stopped using arsenic 20 years ago. So we, we don't see it there. And then this bottom one is <coughs> selenium. Now, selenium isn't particularly problematic from a health point of view. Um, but it's, uh, actually, its primary industrial use is colored glass manufacturing. Again, used in reds. And mostly we couldn't detect it except right over bullseye glass. So, okay, this is starting to look a little damning for them. But again, we want to be careful. So what we did is we went back in 2015 and collected an additional 25 samples right around bullseye. Let's really go in there. And so this is cadmium. There's bullseye glass. All the black dots are the samples we took. There's arsenic and there's selenium. So, okay, we're starting to get at something here. So this point we... We hadn't published yet, but we thought we had, we get to the point where we had ethical responsibilities here to let people know. So we sort of formally let DEQ know, and they, they sat on their thumbs for five months and then eventually put uh, an air quality monitor 120 uh, meters away. And these next results show that. It's a little difficult to tell here. So what I've done, there are uh, what's called ambient benchmarks. So these are state level uh, targets for, uh, for a range of things but uh, there are ones for arsenic and cadmium. There are these lines here that are basically following the x-axis. Now, for the, for this is for the month of October. They left it there for a month. The, aver the average cadmium level was 49 times the state benchmark, and arsenic was 159 times, so not ideal. Uh, I also put on here, there's an agency that's part of CDC called the uh, Agency for Toxic Substance and Disease Registry, and they have medium and short-term safety limits. This, the short-term safety limit is 30 nanograms per cubic meter. That's for one to 14 days of exposure. The average was 29.4 over the month, and this day was 195. So uh, it was actually turned out to be the day we went and collected extra samples. But it was kind of unfortunate. But uh, so clearly very high levels there. And so when we released these results within hours, there was real public outcry. We had public demonstrations the next day. Um, we had to, you know, there was a lot of public meetings, a lot of media interest. The, the state uh, head of the state DEQ resigned. Uh, the federal EPA got involved because they'd given exemptions to the glass industry. They then decided that they'd misinterpreted their own rules. I don't quite know how one does that. I can see misinterpreting somebody else's rules, but your own strikes me as careless. Um, so it turned, it turned very interesting. Now what, from a methodological point of view, is fascinating, within three or four days, both glass manufacturers voluntarily stopped using cadmium arsenic and also chromium. And what we saw, they left the monitors in place, is there was a 99% reduction in cadmium and arsenic. So it, normally with observational studies, you don't get to do that sort of thing. Uh, but we, in this case, it was great. So within a few weeks, even the factories weren't disputing our results. So this was probably cost, this study cost about $20,000 and you know, we clearly had a, a big impact. They're now actually rewriting the entire uh, way which regulation, uh, air regulation is done in Oregon. It used to be on a technology basis, that is, you, know, you had to do X and Y, but they didn't actually measure what came out of the factories and now they're moving to a set of, uh, actually to health-based standards. So let me see, have I got anything else to tell you? So I think really what this tells you is that you, know, you can use bioindicators here as a really effective complement to instrumental monitoring. They're not going to replace it, in part because they're not calibrated to standard. So you don't, you know, it's higher here and lower there, but in this case where you can actually use them and direct instrumental monitoring to a particular point and then find out um, what you have. And I'm about 15 seconds from 35 minutes, so I think I will call it good and I will be happy to take any questions you might have. Yeah.
Go for it. Jeff, with the, with the first study that you did, yeah. um, and you were looking at, at how trees die, and you looked at, at uh, emerald ash borer, did you consider looking at uh, 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 forestry that you did consider this? Um, was there a reason that you didn't look at, at like forestry activities, like clear cutting or, or other uh, just tree harvest activities? Um, well, that's an interesting question, and the, the, the reason we didn't is because we were, uh, you know, 80% of the U.S. population lives in urban areas, and you, particularly when you get outside of Ash's natural range, it's a, it's a different beast in urban areas. So we didn't look at that. It would be interesting to see if we had major changes in, you know, the natural environment out in the woods, because you would expect a different set of mechanisms. And now we've thought about that. Like maybe that affects recreation more than if you're in an urban area. But no, we stuck to this uh, <coughs> just, uh, just for that reason. But, yeah, but it would, but that we, we thought about it. It would be interesting. Okay. Yeah. Michael. So, with that study, you've got the Dutch elders disease. Yeah. Mm. Um, so, you've got a process that you can subject to in the 70s. 30s. <laughs> in New York, yeah, in the 30s, yeah. Yeah, we've, we've been thinking about that, and the, the problem that it just becomes practical is that there isn't as good a spread data on the, on the Dutch elm. So recreating the spread of it is problematic. The, in this case, you have official, official county-wide designations by, there's a, the APHIS, there's an agency that does that. But we've tried to go back uh, and actually, you know, back into historical records as far back as the 30s and recreate it. And we can, we, beyond maybe crudely, maybe at the state level we can do it, but beyond that it starts to become really difficult. So just the resolution of the data aren't very good. We've also thought about um, the chestnut blight. In the first half of the 20th century, that wiped out the American chestnut very quickly. Um, so yeah, it really, it would be interesting. And we've, we've, the Dutch elm we've been really playing with, but we can't, we just don't know when it arrived places. Dutch elm, that sort of data? I don't know. It may be. And interestingly, in Europe, ash trees are dying for a different reason right now. They have a, there's a different pathogen. It's called ash dieback. So that's just actually got, I think, to uh, UK in 2012. Uh, so, yeah, anywhere where you... That seems to be a limiting factor. If you have that, uh, then you can do it. And we, we did a, a, another study where we were interested in trees and crime, because that's another of my interests. And we went to Cincinnati in Ohio because I know the urban forest is there, and they actually geocoded every tree they removed, every single one. And so they, they said the size of the tree, the date, and the geocode. And we were able to use that at a very fine level to see that as you lost trees, you saw spikes in crime. So again, it, most of this is driven by that, the, availability, you know, of the availability of the tree removal. That's the, the limiting factor. Go for it, yeah. Has anyone looked at the causal, actual causal relationships at all? Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, well. I know it's really hard. But well, they, they have uh, in the sense of, the, for example, stress. You know, we, we, have, yes. we, we have done that, um, and uh, there has been stuff with air quality. So we have experimental data that can show air quality and stress. Then when you start to look at... Uh, uh, when you're looking at exercise and we're looking at, so, at um, social connectivity, then you're in observational work. So, no, that's, that's a real limitation here. Is, you know, I can say that there's a plausible mechanistic link, but can I tell you which of those mechanisms is more responsible than the others? No. And clearly, that, that's something that needs to be resolved. And so I think, um, but again, the experimental manipulation is difficult or... When you do create experimental conditions, they become so abstracted from the conditions that one would actually experience nature in that there becomes a concern there. The, only, the one thing you have seen is you, one way you can experiment and manipulate is images. And uh, interestingly, people respond to images of nature quite uh, in, in qualitatively similar ways. And so that offers one option to where you can expose people to that and maybe get at some mechanism there. Um, yeah. 
And, but you got it, and then, yeah. I, I would imagine, yeah. I mean, is, that, is that a potential? Well, because it seemed like the, the exercise, was it exercise, you know, it dipped mm. and then mm. it, it recovered again? Yeah. Because people then got mm. used to running. You know, yeah, running. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just like. People, people adapt to losing. They do. Because they sort of forget, forget about it, but, but your air quality is permanently reduced. I mean, that might be a more. Yeah, because it. Because that's a biophysical mechanism. Yeah, you, you can't adapt to more particulate matter. Um, no, that's, and that was, in fact, why we motivated us to do the MOSS study, because that's what we were interested in. And then we kind of got sidetracked. And what we did, by the way, we didn't find a relationship with heavy metals, though we did find that trees or, uh, could absorb poly, uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And they're an important carcinogen. So it looks like they can actually do that. Um, did you? Yeah. I, I appreciated your comment at the beginning about, uh, about how painful it is to try and pick this stuff apart. Oh, it's uh, horrible. And it, um, but that, you know, the weight of evidence is that something's going on, we just don't know what the heck it is. Yeah. And um, I mean, this causal, these causal mechanisms, so it's both, it's not just the, what's, what are the causal mechanisms for human health, you know, where, where, what's going on within, within the, um, the physiology and biochemistry and, and immunology. Mm -hmm body mm. of an individual, but it's also the ecological yes. um, mechanism, what the heck's going on there. So, but it's, so it's not just two species, it's not just the ash and the bull and the, and the bug, it's mm. all of the microbes and the other insects and the, you know, everything else that's associated with that yep. living system. So it's in, I mean, what, I mean, how do you, have you got any suggestions as to how we move past this, you know, the... I mean, we're just accumulating more and more correlative and, and these indicators that something's going on. I mean, how do we break this? I think, uh, I think one is looking for these natural experiments because I think longitudinally this is, there's a strength there. And then we've got to do long-term randomized controlled trials. Like they're, they're doing one in Louisville and Kentucky. They've just died. But they're, yep, well, they're measuring, they, you know, well, the best they can. I mean, the, the ecological stuff's a bit tricky, but they're doing plantings on these blocks. You know, they're, they're doing tree plantings here and not here. They have people recruited. They're following their health. Will they get at everything? No, but it, you know, the, I think it'll be interesting. I mean, it's going to cost a lot of money and take years. But I think, yeah, look pragmatically for those uh, natural experimental opportunities. Try and fund these big long-term experiments. Uh, and then also, you know, even the, even the observation ones, they all look at a slightly different part of the elephant, you know. And so I think in this case, look at, you can never look at one of the studies in isolation because once, what does most of these studies in isolation tell you? Nothing. They don't, you yeah. know. But, but your point is well taken. This is a ghastly system to, to yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, horrid. <laughs> yeah, well, what are you going to do? <laughs> Cheers. I submitted a paper last, last week showing that uh, uh, areas with more green and blue space have lower suicide rates. Um, so yeah, I think so. There's also uh, neurodevelopmental stuff. I got a paper in review as well on that kids with more trees around their homes uh, do better on standardized tests. So there's a whole range of these outcomes. Um, but the mental health is a tricky one. But yeah, the suicide, suicide is, a, is appealing to look at because it's, the data are good. It's, you're, going to, you're a heartless economist, so you'll understand what I mean by saying, unfortunately, it's not, it's not that common. So that leaves, you know, there's data issues with that. But, um, yeah, it's a good one to look at. But other, I've been thinking about um, prescription uh, records for, say, like anti-anxiety medications or, or antidepressants. But, again, if you're looking simply at cross-sectionally, that's difficult because of the confounding. So can we see changes over time that we could link to changes in prescription patterns, for example, that would be interesting. But yeah, and, and you would think suicide would be a proxy for a lot of other mental health uh, issues. But yeah, so it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting stuff. Uh, yeah. I just wanted to follow up on the adaptation thing that you said the exercise. I mean, have you followed the, those mortality statistics long enough to see if you can be similar? 
Yeah. You know, I, I, the, in that study, the longest we had, the, lo the county would have been six years, and we didn't see any tapering off. But, but the ones that were like five and six years, there's only a few counties. So I would like to revisit, because you would want to have the adaption, and then you would have the tree regrowth. You know, so the, I use actually, so you could expect a dampening of that effect from a number of things. And also vulnerable populations dying because of the, you know, the initial uh, problem. So I, I, I would like to go back to it, yeah. But, you know, hours in the day and all that. <laughs> Any other questions? Or are we, oh, yeah. yeah. What are the properties of the trees you're actually looking at? Because, I mean, you've got variation of colour, area, size, shape. Yep. Have you started to tease out some of the property relationships? <sighs> yeah, now this is a really interesting question because what we start to get to is, you know, well, what is... Are the, like what are the landscape elements to, you know how what was the optimal design for an urban area do you want you know my, my personal view is I suspect big trees are really important you know like if you have a because here I was looking at crown area so just you know looking at above two dimensional crown area that's probably a pretty inadequate way of characterizing trees because you know if you have a hundred square meters of canopy is it better to have that in two trees or ten trees my guess is in two trees or the species, or, uh, you know, the ones that were about deciduous versus evergreen, or flowering trees, or their relative locations, or is it in public or private space? You know, because, you know, do we have, st you would imagine street trees, they encourage people to be, they're accessible to us all, may have a different effect than trees in people's yards. Yes, there's a lot to get at, uh, you know, so th th this is very coarse, uh, absolutely, so, but those, because that's what the real prescription can come to tell. Have some more trees. Yeah, well, okay, but how? You know. Well, there's contradictory results in the literature as well. Oh, like oh well, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, oh, oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Well, the, there were some interesting ones with um, uh, stuff in Sweden with uh, biodiversity and effects on the gut biome. You know, and, and knowing that the gut biome is now, and cr people increasingly think it's important from a public health point of view. So that's... <laughs> Yeah, I don't know why I'm doing this. Too, too <laughs> goddamn complicated. <laughs> too complicated. But uh, uh, anything else? Um, in that case, oh yes, go ahead. Um, one, of the things, one, of the, one of the other things I noted is that on one of the slides, where you were talking about the, uh, the relationship between the annual dashboard and outdoor leisure activity. Yeah, yeah. The one below it was with labor, with labor time. Yeah. And that, that labor time went up yes. with the loss of trees. Yeah. So it was, a, it, was a, it was a, yeah, it was at the margin. It, yeah, labor up, recreation down. Yeah. And, and so it just makes me wonder, you know, if you have, if, if your city has fewer trees, if that's more people working, if that's increased productivity. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, cut, cut them down to stop all the lazy people sitting out underneath them and contemplating the world. But, but also there's a, there's a pretty more fundamental issue is that, you know, I have... I have just said that, well, okay, if we see this impact from the loss of trees, we would see a, a health improvement with the planting or the retention. And that's not def I mean, because there may be something about loss, about environmental degradation, about, you know, that point, that shock. There may, there may not comp I would argue, I would think, it would, if you see trees going away is a bad thing, surely keeping them is a good thing or growing them is a good thing. But it may not be an exact mirror because, uh, you know, the... the, the, the that loss itself, there may be something about just loss that is a problem. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, there is a result in economic or actually from psychology that loss of the issue. Right, yes, yeah, yeah. So, gaining a tree is not as good as not losing Yeah, you know, precisely, yeah. So, that you wouldn't expect, you know, it's the same like willingness to pay, willing to accept, right? You know, it's, it's, they, these are not symmetrical things, but you wouldn't expect. But you would expect them at least to go in the, the, the opposite directions, you know. But, but uh, you know, and, uh, and uh, what it comes down to for me is, you know, people start to say this and like, oh, what's the exact numbers? Like, look, I think we talked about, the, the, you know, value of statistical life, look at that, 7 million bucks or something, multiplied by 21,000. What are these, what's the total value? A bajillion dollars. It doesn't, it's huge, massive. Big enough to care about is what the bottom line is. You know, the, the, that's what it, I think it comes down to. So big enough to act upon while still there being a whole host of questions around mechanism, about urban design, that we need to get at. But I would argue that, yes, it's uh, big enough to care about. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you for your time. <laughs>